Jesus, God, it's such an honor to be your people. It's such an honor to have you in our lives. We thank you for your grace. We thank you that you have rescued us, that you, on your initiative, broke into our lives and answered us when we needed help. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that, God, we would see you more clearly today, that we would have a greater understanding of what that rescue really means for us today. And for those who don't know you, I pray that they would have an encounter with God that they can't argue themselves out of, they can't say that it came from somebody's argument, but that Holy Spirit, you would move on each heart here And we would know that not only are you real, but you're good and you're present and you have plans and purposes for us, for this church, for this city, for this state, for this nation, for this planet. And so we honor you as the king. You are our God and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So how many of you like documentaries? Anybody like documentaries? I really like documentaries. And, uh... I spend, unfortunately, way too much time on social media. Uh, It's just, I don't know. I'm interested in what my friends and family are doing. I read cool articles, and then an hour later, I'm like, I just burned an hour. So I thought, I like documentaries. I should use that time learning some things. So I signed up for this documentary streaming service, and I was watching one uh, a couple months ago on places of worship. It just looked interesting. And it was honestly very much just focused for the most part on the East and Hinduism and Buddhism, but it talked about their temples and some of the rituals and whatever. And I was watching um, these people like go to the temple and talk to the, the monk or the priest and they were doing things like some people were breathing fire, some people were drawing symbols and standing in them, they were kneeling. And, and as I was watching these people worship their God, I couldn't help but realize that there was just this personal presentation of themselves before their God and this humility that they were showing. And it actually convicted me and it, it really changed my worship because I can get caught up in just singing the songs and amening things that I like. I amen sell like three times. That was fantastic. Like, and so I found myself with that new mentality that during certain times of worship, I was physically bowing. There were times where I would literally hit my knees in my bedroom and worship because I wasn't just singing a song about God. I found myself presenting my being before this God and saying, you can have it all. You are my God, and I lay my life before you. You are worthy of everything I can give you. You are my God. And I remember sharing, uh, I think it was last summer, I spent some time in the East. I was in Taiwan, and I had the most interesting conversation with this girl. We were, I was sharing the gospel with her, and she said, if I serve your God... My gods will be angry and they won't bless me anymore. That's not a conversation you're typically going to have in the U.S. And uh, I was, I stepped, like, it just hit me. Like, she's like, this is my God and I serve this being. And this being won't like it if I come over here and I give honor to your God. So therefore, I'm going to keep. And we had a conversation and I shared more whatever. And so again, it's just bringing this fresh understanding of what worship looks like. It's not about songs. It's about actually presenting yourself before the king of the universe and going, I look to you and none other. I don't look to another God. I don't look to another source. I don't look to anything other than you, Jesus. And there is a freedom that comes with that. And so, as, I was, as I've been contemplating this presenting myself before God, before a literal being who has a heart and a personality and thoughts and desires and 
wants to interact with me, I, I was thinking of two scriptures. One is in John chapter 17, verse 3, and it says eternal life is to know you. You know, I thought I knew it offhand, but I don't. We're going to go right here. It says, this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Eternal life is knowing God. There's life in knowing him. There's life in knowing Jesus, having an interaction with him, knowing what he's like and living from that place. And if you don't know him or you don't know about him in truth, it actually causes hindrance because you're gonna live according to things that aren't actually true. And then in Ephesians, Paul prays for the Ephesians and this is a very well-known verse in 17. He says, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the father of glory may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Paul, the apostle Paul, who wrote two thirds of the New Testament, his prayer for the people under him were, God, that they would have a spirit of knowledge and revelation of who you are. That they would have an accurate understanding of who they're dealing with. And so, as I was preparing for this, as I've been thinking about this, as I've been on my personal journey, I was thinking that I think the church, and it's a message that will go on for eternity, and it, we love to talk about aspects of Jesus, but maybe not other aspects of Jesus. You know, Jesus is a lion and a lamb. Yes. You know, it says in Revelation chapter five, it says, you know, this won't make any sense if you don't know what I'm talking about, but it's like, there's no one to open the scroll and they say, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And then when John turns around, it says, there was a lamb that was slain. And so Jesus is a lion and a lamb. And I think we love the lamb part because lambs are cuddly. They're safe. They're not threatening. But there's also a side of Jesus that's a lion. There's also a side of our God that is fire. And I think that we actually hinder ourselves when we only focus on the things that make us comfortable to the detriment of the things that maybe push us a little bit. Because he, if, if you just focus on, and again, these are both true. And if you've ever heard me preach, this is what I preach. So you can't accuse me of not. But he, he loves us. His grace is more than enough. He will never leave us, never forsake us. He's got plans and purposes for us. And it's amazing. But when you realize that there's a lion behind all of that, it takes on a new life. And I think that this is really, really well demonstrated in Revelation chapter one. John is in heaven. He gets pulled up and he says, then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands and in the middle of the lampstands, one like the son of man. He was clothed with a long robe and a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. And from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in its full strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though he was dead. Just to stop for a second, you know, this is John the Beloved speaking. This is the one who laid his head on Jesus' chest at the Last Supper. This is the one that Jesus entrusted his mother to from the cross. And this is his response when he sees Jesus in raw form. And it says, and this is where I want to go from the lion and the lamb. We see this lion, but it says, but he being Jesus laid his right hand on me saying, fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. 
I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and of Hades. This is Jesus in the midst of being one whose hair is like snow and eyes are like fire and a sword coming out of his mouth and his voice is like many waters. In the midst of that, he comes and says, fear not. I think we get so comfortable with the fear not that we forget the one who's saying it. I remember, um, some of you may remember Joe Crispin. He went to church here a long time ago, played Penn State at, um, played basketball at Penn State. And he said this thing one time, and I never forgot it. He says, we always think of Jesus as the shepherd with the little lamb on his shoulder, but we forget that he's a lion. We forget that he's the king. And like I said, I think it's to our detriment to forget who he really is. And the Bible, I think God is bringing the church back to the fear of the Lord. I think there is a vast lack of the fear of the Lord because we only look at the lamb. We only see the kindness and the gentleness, which are, again, they both exist. One is not to the, to the pulling away of the other. They're both equal. But the fear of the Lord, there are scriptures. I looked them up, scripture after scripture. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Yes. It says the fear of the Lord brings blessing. The fear of the Lord leads to the path of life. And this one, I, I, I'm sure I've read it before, but it just popped off at me. It says those who fear the Lord will be confident. We, when you realize that this Jesus with a sword in his mouth and fire in his eyes is the one that says, I'll never leave you, that matters. When you realize the king of the universe is the one you're presenting yourself to, all of a sudden there is confidence. When you realize that that's the guy who says, I am a good father. That's the guy who says, I know what you need before you even ask. That's the guy that says, I will fight your battles. If that dude's fighting your battles, you're good. But if we just see him as the kind, humble Jesus, which again, he is. I'm going to say this the whole time. He is. But if you just focus on the lamb, you may think he's a little bit of a pusher. He needs to be feared. And let me explain. I don't mean fear as in you run away from him. Because it says in 1 John that perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment. My punishment. And if you've given yourself to Jesus, your punishment is gone. He took it away. You have nothing to fear because his love is there. So I'm not talking about being afraid of God in that sense. It also says he's not given us a spirit of fear. It also says he's, he, he's given us not a spirit of fear, but a spirit of adoption. So I'm not talking about being afraid of him. But listen, there has to be a place where you recognize the magnitude of the God we serve. There is a reality check when you come into the presence of the Almighty that you have to bow where it strips you of all your strength and all your righteousness and all your power and you go you and you alone. I love the word holy. It means set apart. He is holy, holy, holy. There is no other God like him. There is no other being in existence or ever will be that can even compare. And this is the one that we present ourselves to in our worship. It's not about just singing a song. It's about bringing your life before the Holy One and going, God, you're worthy of it all. What do you want to do? I think some of us, we have, we have struggles of letting things go. We have struggles. We have changes we need to see and make in our lives. I believe those changes happen when you find yourself in the presence of the Holy One. Because if you don't fear the Lord, you forget who you're dealing with. It is a breeding ground for compromise. It's a breeding ground for 
just lack of passion. It's a breeding ground for distraction. But man, one glimpse of Jesus and who he really is will grip your life forever. We need to get back to the place of realizing who we're dealing with. We need to get back to the place of the fear of the Lord where we give him the honor and the glory and we lay our lives before him and say, you're worthy. I believe you. I trust you. If you say not to go there, I'm not going to go there. If you say to go there, I'm going to go there because you are the God that I've presented my life before. Not just the God I show up on Sunday to tip a hat to or to add to my life because hopefully you'll bless me, but actually the God who is worthy of everything I have and everything I will ever be. Man, you get a community of people that see Jesus the way he really is, change the world. I believe God wants to renew our awe. And so in Hebrews chapter 12 says, this phrase once more indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken And thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. Our God is a consuming fire. Consuming meaning it takes up, it moves. I I lived in California for four years. We are known for wildfires. I remember when I lived here, you know, everybody hears about wildfires on the news. Dude, wildfires are insane. I had no idea until I moved out there. Like, what the heck, man? Like, literally, you walk outside, it looks like the apocalypse because it's just ash and smoke and the sun's shining. And you're like, you can't breathe sometimes. It's just wild. It's destructive. It, it consumes everything in its path. God is a consuming fire. He wants to consume everything in your life. He wants every aspect of your life to be consumed with Jesus. And the thing is, everything he touches becomes life-giving. So I was talking about finances a minute ago. You let God in your finances, life's going to show up. You let God in your relationships, the kingdom's going to move. He is life. And if he is consuming an aspect of your life, then that's going to be life. But we sometimes are like, I like how I do what I do. And I know you say this, but I'm good. And he's like, okay, cool. And so you're actually cutting that section of your life off from what he wants to do. We were talking... um, By the way, I I do a young adult ministry now. I forgot to say. And so we met on Friday and we were talking about walls in our hearts. We're talking about how we build up walls to protect us. And most of us have those walls because of things we've walked through in our past. And you're like, I'm never going to let that happen again. So you harden yourself or you develop like all these defense mechanisms. And I see some of you smiling. You know exactly what I'm talking about. We've all got them. And so I, when I was in school, I, a mentor that I had, he said, I really believe the Lord wants to knock down some of your walls because your walls are not only keeping the pain out, they're keeping what God wants to do out and they're keeping the things God's doing in you from getting out. And I said, and I was just very honest I like my walls. I don't, want to, I don't want Jesus to take those walls down. I'm super comfortable behind my massive fortress. I'm really comfortable here. Nobody can hurt me. I'm good. And I loved my mentor. He was super. He's like, hey, bro, you can keep them. God, will lo- God loves you. He's not in a hurry, but I'm telling you, he doesn't want those things there. And then we met again, 
And I'm like, well, God might be right. Maybe. <laughs> I, I'm going to have to think more about it, but I think God might actually know what he's talking about. Um, so we'll see. And then I was with him a little bit later, and I'm like, all right, I want to lay this down. I want to lay down my self-protection that is causing so much other dysfunction in my life and let God have his way and let him be my defender. Let him be the one that takes care of me. And if somebody hurts me or somebody knocks me down, let him be the one that picks me back up. And I, I can love freely. I can be vulnerable. I can let my true being out because my walls are down. The reason I could do that was because I was getting a revelation of who God actually is. When I realized even more of his goodness, when I realized even more of his ability to take care of me, when I come even more under the fear of the Lord of like, you are God and you know what you're talking about, all of a sudden, I can grow, I can stretch, I can sacrifice because I know who's got me and he's a fire. Yes. There's a, there's a, I, I, I thought about not sharing this quote because I've heard it so many times in preaching, but it just seemed so appropriate. But in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, if you've seen that movie, yeah, it's phenomenal. But at the end of the movie, two characters are talking. doesn't matter who. But they're talking about Aslan the lion, who is a picture of Jesus. And they said, he's not safe, but he's good. I love that quote. Because Jesus isn't safe. He will stretch you. Yeah. He will pull you out of your chains and your mire. And he will put you on a path of life and adventure. Yeah. I was thinking today, like, it's like I remember being a little kid and a thunderstorm was coming. And you know, like the clouds roll in and the wind starts swirling. And I just wanted to go inside. Like you could feel like the atmosphere chain. You're like, and my dad was like, let's just sit here for a minute. And I'm like, are you crazy? <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Something's happening that's way bigger than me that I can't control that is just swirling in the power. What if God wants to do that in you? What if he wants to be a thunderstorm in your life where just the power of his goodness flows through, where the lion and the fire want to come out and want to do something with you beyond anything you've ever thought or imagined. But we're satisfied to just be cool. We're satisfied behind our walls. We're satisfied to just go to church. Instead of presenting our very beings before him and go, just do what you want to do. That's a scary prayer. But the more we understand who he is, the easier the decision will come. Joel Watkins said something to me yesterday. Well, he was quoting a friend of ours. But he said, when I go to the Grand Canyon, no one has to tell me to be in awe. Yeah. It's like, there's not a sign. Now be in awe. Thank you. <laughs> Like, you approach it, and you're like, oh, my gosh. I had heard about this, but I had no idea. Wow. And you start inspecting and looking, and this is amazing. How much more the one that created that? We get a glimpse of him. No one's going to have to tell you to hit your knees. No one's going to be like, now's the time when you should say thank you. You're just going to be like, oh my goodness, take it all. Take it all, God. I don't want to hold anything back from you. I don't want to compromise anymore. I, 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 
I don't want to be distracted anymore. I don't want to give my worship to other things because here's the thing. We all worship something. There's not a person on the planet that's not worshiping something. If you're an atheist, you're worshiping something. It can be yourself. So worship team, if you want to come up, I guess I want to just end with this question. What are you worshiping today? Who are you worshiping today? And is there a fresh revelation that God has for you to take your worship of him more deeply? So if you'll stand up, I want to pray. Pastor, Pastor Bill Johnson from the, he's known for, for this quote, everybody wants a king like Jesus because he's a lion and a lamb. He's the most powerful being in existence. He holds the world and the universe in his hand. But yet he comes with compassion. He comes with meekness. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. He's full of patience. He's full of love. And it's all toward you. It's all toward you. And so close your eyes if you would. I want you to picture and imagine that Jesus, and picture him like he's in Revelation, fire in his eyes, sword in his mouth, voice like many waters, and he's looking at you, just you. You're the only one in the room and that fire in his eyes is love and compassion for you. He's got a smile on his face. And he's reaching out to you saying, will you come with me? Will you trust me? Will you allow me to speak into your life? Will you give me that thing that I've been asking for? Will you lay your offense down? Will you lay your anger and your bitterness down and let me heal that place? Will you let your walls down and allow me to be your defender? Because I don't know if you've noticed, you defending yourself isn't working too hot. we go into this song, I now I want you to begin to surrender and worship your God. Just like that girl said, my God doesn't want me to serve your God. I'm asking you, who is your God? And will you worship him in this moment? and you've never given your life to Jesus. The good news is he loves you and he's pursuing you. And if you will give him your sins, if you will give him your shame, if you will give him the broken things, he promises to take them and make all things new. He promises to give you a clean slate, to give you a clean heart. It says you literally will become a new creation 
and that he will reside within you forever. He's been pursuing you your whole life. You can't get too far that he can't bring you back. Some of you, you can feel it in your chest. That's God. Will you, will you say, Jesus, take my sin. Jesus, make me new. I believe you can do it. Jesus, take my life. I want to know what I was created for. I want to live a life of passion. I want to burn for the things of eternity. If that's you and you've never made that decision before, will you put your hand up? I want to pray for you real quick. Jesus, I thank you for these hands that are up. Lord, I thank you that, God, your pursuit has not been in vain, but that, Lord, your relentlessness and your love for them has found its mark, and I pray that today would be the start of a brand new existence. Lord, I pray for the rest that, God, we would see you with a spirit of wisdom and revelation. That, Holy Spirit, you would open up our eyes to see God like never before. And that we would be people who lay our lives before the King on a daily basis and say, you can have it all. You've paid for it all with your blood. Take it all, God. Thank you for joining us. Please make sure to like, share, and subscribe. And if you liked what you heard today, please consider donating. You can support C3 by clicking the giving button on our homepage at cccsc.org or by texting CCCSC to 833-257-5698. Thanks again. Have a great day, and remember, God has a great plan for your life.